Good morning. Welcome to day two. Um, so, surprise, um, this is not actually a talk. This is actually the first stop on my book tour for my new upcoming book, Systems Thinking for Instant Analysis. Note the subtitle, How Fast is Better Than No Ast. So, <laughs> the genesis of this talk was I gave a talk at SRECon um, in Europe last year. And what it was about was sort of my manifesto that, hey, SRE, we need to not oversimplify it and sort of equate site reliability engineering with SLOs and on-call. What we actually are is a systems thinking discipline, which is geared at understanding systems and designing sort of good systems interventions. So I gave a talk and I sort of touched on a bunch of systems thinking methods and then Dr. Laura said, hey, how about giving a talk about systems thinking for incident analysis um, in an approachable way at, at, at LFICONF. So here we are. So, yeah. Um, why did I pick the crab for my fake O'Reilly book cover? Okay. Crabs keep evolving independently from different kinds of, uh, you know, origin animals. They have done this at least five times, if not more. So why is this interesting? So, Crabs are living in a system, like a, a, an ecosystem, um, in fact, a bunch of different marine ecosystems around the world, and the system keeps creating pressures that shape animals into crabs. Crabs are an emergent systems phenomenon, and that's why it is the most appropriate cover for the O'Reilly book. Systems are everywhere. You know, everything that we do is systems, everything we think about is systems. And there are some techniques that we can use to think about systems in a slightly more structured manner than we typically do day to day. They can help us ask better questions, which I think is the primary kind of um, you know, way that this feeds into incident analysis. But they can also help us in various other ways about when we communicate and we think and we sort of um, try and impose or share our mental models with others. So, Probably everyone in this room has seen this, so I won't spend too much time on it, but a system is something that's got elements and parts with interactions. And if, we're, if it's an engineered system, typically what we do is we draw the system boundaries around some set of components that are geared towards some sort of function. So your production system is a system. It's geared towards doing the things that your users want to do with your system. You know, um, this hotel is a system. It's geared towards, uh, you know, providing comfortable accommodation and conference uh, facilities for people. So think about um, any system boundary is sort of arbitrary because systems are always interacting to, with, with the environment, with, you know, other systems. But thinking about that functional boundary is pretty helpful. Then a lot of us have probably also heard about complex systems. So systems can be fairly simple, fairly linear. But a lot of systems have multiple components. They have nonlinear interactions of feedback loops, which means that a small um, input here can result in a large sort of change over there. So this is the you know, butterfly flapping its wings causes a tornado in you know, somewhere that has tornadoes that isn't here. Um, <laughs> my geography is bad. <laughs> um, complex systems always have interactions with an environment. You know, there's no point in building a complex system in a, in a closed box, right? Complex systems are dynamic. You know, they, they, they have flows going through them. They're always changing state. They're never the same now as they were a second ago. They're in flux. And they have state and history. And think about even at the level of, you know, one, one computer system, like one physical box. That's a complex system. It has state. It has history. That's why sometimes we have to restart, right? Because something got in a state that we... That, you know, isn't a good state. Um, about complex systems, um, problems often arise in the interactions. We, sometimes you look, at a, you look at a system that's having a problem and every component of it is doing something that seems okay, but the whole thing, the whole thing is, is bad, right? So when we think about complex systems, these are systems that do not work well with the human brain. Your brain is not good at thinking about complex systems. <laughs> yes, I see someone shaking their head. Um, hopefully in agreement. Um, well, you know, our brains expect the world to be kind of linear. You know, we, we, you know, we evolved, uh, we are, you know, hunting animals and picking berries and all of this is pretty simple and linear. And now we are trying to manage big, distributed, complicated computer systems. And yeah, we need a little help. And that's systems thinking. 
So systems thinking is a discipline which is focused on understanding and modeling and optimizing complex systems. Um, I've put this um, cover of this wonderful book here, Handbook of Systems Thinking Methods. Um, I think anyone is interested in this from a sort of an engineering perspective can probably benefit from picking this book up. It's by Paul Salmon, Neville Stanton, Walker Hulme, and, and so on and so forth. These slides will be shared. Um, this is the book that I have seen that is most focused on being useful to folks who are doing engineering, well, practitioners. It's not geared specifically at software engineering, but it's very, very much geared towards this is a tool set for practitioners, and that's very useful. Um, some other great books are Nancy Levison, who has come up repeatedly already in this, in this conference, um, Engineering a Safer World. This is her, her STAMP method, um, which is systems thinking applied to safety. And then this is an oldie but a goodie, um, Thinking in Systems by Danella Meadows. Um, she's sort of one of the originators of some of the system dynamics work that we're going to look at a little bit down the line. Yeah. Okay, so this is a slide that we're going to skip over super briefly. <laughs> But this is just to say that systems thinking, because systems are everywhere, like literally from crabs to computers and anything else you can think of, systems thinking has come from a lot of different routes, um, from things like cybernetics, control theory, sort of early computing, artificial intelligence, all the way from you know, biological sciences. So it has a lot of roots. We don't need to think about that. We are doing systems thinking for dummies today. We are not gonna sweat too many details. <laughs> um, Useful systems thinking can look as simple as this. Uh, we're gonna look into this a little bit more detail later on, but this is an example of some stuff I put into one of the um, Slack incident reports that was published on the Slack Eng blog a year or two ago. And uh, this is a system dynamics causal loop diagram, but simplified and with emojis. <laughs> so you don't need any special training to read this. It's just showing you two, two kind of the two sides of the metastable um, failure um, kind of phenomenon in this system, right? So one of the messages here is, you know, we can think about the, we can look at these tools and we can apply them in ways that are pretty accessible to ourselves, to our colleagues. So before we go any further. Um, I just want to talk about what I think the goals of incident analysis are. And this is going to actually be my big controversial slide because every time you do a keynote, you have to do a big controversial thing. Like you have to say something that puts the cat among the pigeons. And this is this slide. So when we analyze incidents, we want to make sense of them. We want to learn things that we didn't know before. Things that might not be obvious on the face of them. And we want to communicate. We want to communicate them clearly so that others in our organizations can learn as well. And they can remember. Um, we want to see our incident reviews ideally maybe turn into folklore, you know. Um, to me, the most successful metric of a good incident write-up is if somebody is drawing your diagrams on whiteboards five years later for new people joining the company, assuming the content is still relative. Now, the controversial bit, planning better action items. Now, <laughs> Action items are a bad word in this community. And, um, you know, that's entirely reasonable. For a lot of years, the tech industry, we were very prone to put the cart, behind, cart before the horse and say, dive right into action items and not do the sense making, communicating, and remembering part. And um, I think, you know, it's a little bit to throw the baby out with the bathwater because I think, as, as folks who are deep in systems and deep in incidents, I think we also do have a responsibility to help our organizations to plan better action items. Because you know, there's a, we, we, know, we know in this community that the, the pitfalls of just reflexively adding a lot more dashboards, adding a lot more process, you know, we know that a lot of action items actually turn into a net negative. And um, it's, it's better, I think, to have good action items that actually help our organizations. So, that's why I put that one in. That's my big controversial assertion in this keynote. So, what is this slide about? Sense making. Hmm? <laughs> so this is a thing called the hermeneutic circle, and this is a way that we make sense of things. So we start off with a mental model of an incident, and we have our initial understanding of it. 
And then we go and we look at, we do interviews with people and we ask questions and we look at transcripts of, uh, you know, maybe incident channels or, or meetings and we look at documents and we look at, you know, code and pull requests and, you know, monitoring graphs. And this changes, changes our mental model of the incident. So we can go back and we can update our, our mental model and then we can, we can loop around again. We can revisit that material. We can ask new questions. We can, we can take new, new, new insights away from the material that we've already seen. And for something that's a pretty complicated scenario, I think you often have to traverse this loop a few times to, to get to where you need to be. And this is why, why instant analysis takes time, why you can't just sit down the next morning and you know, interview everybody and have your, your, your quality incident um, report and your, your sense making done by, by Thursday. It just doesn't work that way. So the hermeneutic circle obviously uh, originates with uh, the philosopher uh, Heidegger. But I put Lauren Hochstein here because he's the first person that I saw that applied this to the world of incident analysis. So communicating and remembering. These are the, the next phases. When we make a model, we are simplifying reality. And when we write a report or an instant analysis, we are simplifying reality as well. But we can still have quite a lot of complexity here. When we build a model, we're highlighting a particular sort of aspect of a situation. And we can often represent them visually, which is great for the communication aspect. A lot of people are very visual thinkers and having visual um, representations of our models helps to reinforce what we're saying with the words as well. So visual models are very good, but they can also, they, 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 they help us to show how, they, how things interact. Um, that's much, much easier to do visually than it is to do in text. Um, and this is a much easier way to sort of communicate these sorts of rich, complex system scenarios. So visual models are very, very good, um, and they're also very good for remembering. So um, I'm guessing everyone has seen uh, Reason's Swiss cheese model uh, probably several times. Um, this model is just, it's, it's, it's a model of how incidents happen. So incidents happen when, you know, according to Reason, when, um, and there's a lot of problems with this model, of course, uh, but his, his assertion is that we have heavily defended systems and incidents happen when something gets through some of these holes when they line up. So this, this model isn't going any away anytime soon because it is just so easy to remember because you think cheese, Swiss cheese, is just, you know, it's a brain worm, right? We can make these in our incident reports as well. This is an example that I really like. This is from Fred Herbert from Honeycomb. Um, this is a report from last October. And he coins this sort of phrase, the shark fin graph. And this is how he sort of, he's, uh, he's sort of applied this model to, to this, 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 this the pattern that he keeps seeing, where things get held up in a queue, and you see this sort of ascending list of waiting, um, waiting requests with, 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 with ever increasing um, kind of durations, right? Um, and the, then the shark fin drops when, when you unblock that system. This is, this is really powerful stuff. This just seems like the small little detail of this incident report. But um, I want to think about how Nora's keynote yesterday talked about how people develop expertise in an organization. And human expertise is, in, in large part, it's stuff like this. It's saying, okay, I've seen this pattern. And again, harking back to Dave Woods' talk, you know, here's a pattern that I see. And I see this pattern in my graphs. And I, now I can sort of impose this mental model of the situation on what's probably happening here. You know, I can take this, and it, it, it's an intellectual shortcut, but this is also a form of expertise, right? And putting this name on it and calling it out explicitly in an incident report, I think this is really powerful stuff. So we have different levels of incident analysis or different sort of kind of aspects of our systems, our socio-technical systems that are relevant to, in, to, to incident analysis. I think everyone has probably seen this model. This is um, above the line and below the line, thanks to uh, Dr. Woods. 
and also Dr. Cook. Um, so by and large, our, the above the line segments of our systems are things that are happening in your heads, um, sort of human driven stuff, processes, uh, people making sense of things, people trying to pl making plans, um, taking actions, and then below the line, generally speaking, we have tools and code and sort of automation and artifacts. And when we think about our systems and incidents and what goes on, obviously we have to think about both above the line and below the line. Now, some systems thinking tools, um, and I think many people think about systems thinking tools mostly in terms of the below the line. And I think that's certainly true because of the way that we share incident reports publicly in the industry. We talk a lot more about what's below the line than what's above the line because you know, what's above the line can get a bit embarrassing at times. Um, you know, organizations do not like to talk about this stuff, and it can be very, 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 de very delicate inside of an organization as well, even to talk about it privately. But that said, systems thinking tools can often be used to look at both aspects. When we look at an incident, we can look at it in three sort of levels. Causation, which is your incident mechanism, so looking at an example of this, remember about two years ago, there was a very big Salesforce outage that was caused by a DNS snafu, and um, rather notoriously, they fired somebody over it. But um, the, the causation of that accident was that an operator pushed a global DNS change, triggered a latent bug in a restart script for their bind daemon, and that took their, their DNS down because that was pushed globally kind of in a rapid fashion. Operators then lost access to their production systems for some hours because the access depended on DNS. So that's, that's causation. That's the sort of stuff that we are, most incident reports are, or and reviews are like 80% 80, 80 causation, I would say. But we can get a little bit deeper. We can look at conditions. What made that incident possible? So high load on the DNS server um, kind of uncovered that latent bug the, the latent bug was there, and we had that sort of situation where access to production depended on DNS working in a way that was not intended or not planned. So conditions, and usually the other 20% of most of our incident reports are made up of that. Then the systemic and organizational factors, so that could be lack of investment in, in your canary automation, could be lack of investment in testing backup access mechanisms, production pressure, um, you know, all this kind of cultural and kind of organizational prioritization stuff. This is where we get into the, you know, root cause capitalism bit. But, <laughs> yeah, uh, which, which is not necessarily a terribly useful observation or insight, but, you know, there's a lot of places that you can go on the way there that can be useful. So what's helpful when we are doing these um, analyses is, you know, try and make sure that we need to do, we need to look at causation. Causation, causation's important. You know, uh, conditions are important, but the systemic and organizational factors should not be neglected either, subject to what you can manage politically in your organization, right? So, looking at exploring some sort of detailed systems thinking tools. Um, this is one from Brandon Gregg, um, Utilization, Saturation, and Errors Analysis. And this is usually thought of as a method that is good for, um, for investigating kind of performance problems, like or gray or intermittent kinds of um, performance problems. Um, but actually, it's actually pretty useful for distributed systems problems, and I think it's pretty useful for incident analysis as well. I mean, I've used this in a bunch of, a bunch of times. So um, the idea here is that you look at the resources in your system and you look at are, are they heavily utilized or are they saturated, like these queues are happening, and is something throwing errors. And this is, this is definitely a very below the line thing. So we're, we're starting kind of below the, below the line and kind of working upwards. But what we can do is we can, you know, as we think about our analysis, we can think about what elements of the system were heavily utilized. How do we get into that state? And that's where we can get, it, get into more interesting questions. You know, is this, was this a symptom of something else? Was this a sort of a secondary effect? Or was this something that was sort of directly in that causal line? And then we can even ask questions like above, we can move up above the line. 
when we had this situation with the, with the utilization or the errors, did, did operators know about it? Did they have good mental models? What were they thinking? What were they doing? Did they have processes that were geared towards resolving this? So, you know, even with this sort of very sort of, you know, causal focus kind of model, we can ask a lot of interesting questions. Then the second thing that I have used very often is causal loop analysis. So this again is Donella Meadows who wrote Thinking in Systems. And um, there's this famous book from, I think originally the 60s, called Limits to Growth, where they tried to use um, kind of systems dynamics to model when we are going to run out of stuff on the planet. Uh, the unfortunate news is right about now was, was you know, their analysis. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> yeah, um, team here, you may do all this great systems analysis. Will people listen to you? Not necessarily, but anyway, bigger problems. Um, so you can wind up with these like, you know, quite big complex diagrams. So what we're trying to do here is we're modeling, you know, population, industrial output, um, you know, soil, fertility, all this kind of stuff, all in one like, big diagram. You know, this is sort of, you know, tries to encompass everything and how it, it, how it affects everything else. Um, let's do a little simple technical example. Um, so if I'm building a little distributed file system, so I have this method here, which is the, the, the guts of my control loop. I'm gonna iterate over all the blocks in my file system. I'm gonna check if they have uh, replicas that are heart beating okay. Am I, am I under my minimum replicas that I want for each block? If that's the case, I replicate my block. Simple, yeah. Okay, so it's gonna look something like this. If I lose a block, I'm gonna you know, copy some blocks and wind up with the same number of replicas of each of my pink and my blue blocks. Straightforward. So, here is a kind of a simple, at the start of a causal loop diagram. So if my heartbeats fail, I'm gonna do replication, but the replication process is gonna increase my system load. And sometimes if my system load gets too high, not all the time, I will fail some heartbeats. So if I completely overwhelm replica, I'm gonna get failed heartbeats. So we add a plus sign on all these arrows to show that if you have more of one thing, you're gonna get more of the other thing. Okay, simple. Now we add in some other things that sort of factor into the, the, into the system. So if we have hardware and power failure, we can have more failed heartbeats. If we have higher read load or write load, so if we're writing, writing more blocks, we're gonna get new blocks added, we're gonna get more replication. If we're doing a lot of reads, system load increases. So. Then we have this, um, this other sort of concept here, which is how many replicas do we have for each block? Um, that's a configurable system property. You know, the operators can change that. So um, depending if we decide to have, if we decided that every um, replica should have, or every block should have three replicas, not two, we would get a whole bunch of replication and, and you know, and system load. Okay, so what I've added here is this or in the middle. This says it's a reinforcing loop. This is a feedback loop. And the reason it's a reinforcing loop is because we have this sort of central loop, the one I started off with, and that has all pluses on all of those arrows. If one of them was a minus, we would have a balancing loop. We would have a loop that has a sort of a self-regulating kind of, kind of aspect as opposed to this sort of vicious cycle potential that we have in a reinforcing loop. So in a reinforcing loop, that's when we have the, the potential to get into cascading failures and kind of metastable failure situations. So like this, imagine we lose a rack all at once. Now, now we're replicating a whole bunch of blocks and now, now you know, we've overwhelmed our machines because this is a very bad distributed system that I have developed. And uh, yeah, now we get into a bad state. Now our system load has kind of flick, flicked over and we've flipped around. We've gone from this healthy state of, you know, a healthy level of load in that reinforcing loop to an unhealthy level. And it's just gonna stay in that bad situation, just gonna try and keep churning out more replication and more replication and more failures until an operator kind of comes in and, and fixes this. So I, 
I have often come across these kinds of uh, vicious cycle type situations, these metastable failures when I've done incident analysis. And it is really, really valuable to model this because this then gives you ways to think about how can you start putting in some safeguards to prevent your system flipping over into that bad state. A lot of the time you're stuck with the basic sort of um, the basic loop that has the feedback cycle, but you can help things by adding in delays to make it less likely to sort of have a small perturbation flip you into the bad state, or you can do things like you can add throttling or, or rate limiting, which sort of inserts a little balanced loop that slows down your, 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 your feedback loop. So there's a bunch of insights you can have around here. And this, this was describing a metastable meta failure, and this is derived from system dynamics just with emojis. So it doesn't have to be intimidating. You can go off and you can do your system dynamics analysis and you can, you, can, you, can, you can present that to your colleagues who probably don't all understand how to read a system dynamics causal loop diagram in this kind of way and they will get it. So We can also, uh, we can talk about kind of human, um, kind of above the line stuff in terms of system dynamics as well. A lot of people have observed that it's typical in an organization over a multi-year period. You're going to get like, some exec will say, ah, we, we need more reliability, we're going to hire some people, we're going to dedicate you know, time to, to doing reliability stuff, and everything is great, and now your systems are more reliable. And then so maybe you have a reorg, new, new person comes in and they say, ah, well, you know, why are we investing so much in reliability when our reliability is great? Let's." you know, reallocate resources, so you're, 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 you and, and, and then after some time, you know, things take their toll and your system reliability is probably less. So this is how you get that kind of characteristic sawtooth investment thing when you have a balancing loop like this, but with long delays. So long delays are, are, are terrible for humans, we don't understand them. You know, it's one of these things where, you know, our brains don't do it very well. So moving on to a completely different perspective, this is the energy barriers perspective. Um, this comes from kind of a very traditional safety science view where we're thinking about like physical energy, so you know train crashes and, and road crashes. But I think it's still useful for us in a, in a variety of different ways. And you wouldn't use this for every kind of software incident, but you could use it for some. So, the idea here is you have this kind of hierarchy of ways that you can control energy and prevent bad energy transfers in your systems. So if we think about car crashes, you can prevent your buildup of energy by not driving. You can reduce your amount of energy by driving more slowly. You can try and prevent crashes, um, the uncontrolled release of energy by ABS, having you know, good tires. You can have crumple zones and seat belts um, so that you have a better distribution of energy in a crash. You can build sidewalks to keep potential victims away, and you can have first aid and you know, emergency medicine and rehabilitation and other sorts of mitigation. So how can we apply this perspective to software incidents? So a few years ago, while I was at Google, we deleted our entire CDN, and this was very bad. Um, <laughs> it was very bad. Um, <laughs> So and the way that this happened was that there was a command line tool that basically parsed a regex in a wrong way and instead of deleting the one rack of machines that was intended, deleted everything and it did it basically instantly because it was a logical deletion involving throwing away a, um, an encryption key. So oops. But how could we think about the energy barrier perspective in relation to this? So prevention, we, if we don't have tooling that can decommission CDN machines, that's not feasible. We, we, you know, you gotta have decommissioning. You can reduce, you could rate limit how many CDN, CDN machines could be eh, decommissioned over a period of time. You could do that in the infrastructure. You can control it. So tools can give clear feedback to operators about, you know, hey, I'm going to decommission 10 machines versus I'm now going to decommission 300,000 machines or however many it was. Um, modifying. So instead of logical deletion instantly that cannot be undone, you could have a time-limited undo mechanism. So you could recover the key maybe for the next 24 hours or something like that. You can do separation, so you can build zones in your infrastructure and require different roles to be assumed to perform deletions per zone. 
and you can mitigate so you can have um, you can make sure your tooling to recommission your CDN machines is, is, is much more is, is, is very is, as fast and efficient as possible. So we can definitely apply this perspective to certain types of software incidents. I think runaway automation scenarios are a really good um, application of energy barriers perspective. And I think that another one is security, actually. So how can we use this for incident analysis in particular, though? Like, is, is, this, is this just not a sort of a, a, an action item as perspective? Um, this is something that we can think about when we're doing our analysis, because when we look at a particular incident, you can go through this sort of um, range of, of barriers and mitigations that you can have, and you can ask which, which, which were in place, what happened with those um, mitigations or barriers, and why aren't other levels in place? And not in a sort of a blameful, well, you know, why didn't you build this thing? But are there good reasons why this is not feasible? Um, and you'll often get, particularly in domains that you don't know so much about, as which hopefully is most of the time if you're doing kind of you know, cross-team incident investigations, you'll get really interesting answers about why you can't have tip certain types of controls or mitigations. So this is a really, this is a complete misapplication of the energy barriers perspective. This is not what people intend you to do, do it for, but asking about why the particular barriers operate in particular ways or are missing will give you information about systems and constraints that I don't think is easy to get in other ways. So, Then this is a different method, hierarchical task analysis, or HTA. This is kind of more about describing systems. So what you do is you look at your system and you decompose your systems into goals, sub-goals, operations, and plans. And you can basically describe any sort of uh, system in this way, as far as I know. And it includes both the, the machine bits and the human bits. And um, you don't do a, it's not a particular sort of analysis method here, but what you do is you use your HTA to inform other systems analysis techniques. So here's a simple example. If I want to serve user requests, I need to ensure sufficient healthy capacity. So I can do auto-scaling based on um, CPU usage. I can do blue-green rollouts to make sure that I have a, a way to flip back if I push something bad. I can alert if I'm serving too many 500s. I could do lots of other things. And you can go deeper into all of those um, plans as well. Um, but how you can use this is there's a technique called EastBL. And I'm going to need to look at my speaker notes to remember what EAST stands for. <laughs> Event analysis of systemic teamwork. Um, and BL is broken links. So this is really cool. I like this one. Um, so you start off with your um, hierarchical task analysis. And then for each of your goals and your, each of your processes, you analyze how information needs to be shared to do those tasks, including feedback on whether the task worked or not. So for, East, for, for instant analysis, we can look at um, what, what links broke in this incident? Which parts of um, you know which which parts of our system should have been sharing information in some particular way, but they didn't? Um, or was something? Um, and links can break in multiple different ways, so they can just be unavailable, or they can actually you can lie as well, which is an interesting thing that we don't often think about. Um, so you can get wrong results. So you can, think about, you can think about things in terms of what were the links that were involved in this system, um, what broke, what were the effects. Um, so you can sort of use this to separate the cause and effect a little bit. And were there surprises? So I think this is, the broken link stuff is actually something that we're relatively good with when we do system design. Like we spend a lot of time thinking about our links and you know, what we're going to do when a particular thing breaks. So it's often interesting to ask, well, you know, you probably designed this. You know, what, what, like, were you surprised about what actually happened? And what else could have gone wrong as a result of this that didn't? So we can kind of pull some, some, some questions out of this. Um, the other thing that I think is really interesting about this is this is a mechanism that is very valuable at making us describe our control mechanisms. So we flip back to the other slide for a moment. Yeah. 
So typically, we draw a system diagram of our infrastructure, and you would have, you know, load balancer, um, kind of web servers, application servers, databases. And we never actually model the control systems around that. We don't model the monitoring. We don't model how things are provisioned and deprovisioned. We don't model how things are scaled up and scaled down. And I think that's something that we neglect to our detriment. So thinking about that and thinking about EastVL gives us a bunch of great questions to ask in our incident analysis, and it gives us great ways to pre present our findings. And when we do this kind of analysis, we can find interesting patterns about particular links that are prone to breakage um, and how we sort of deal with that breakage in our systems. Um, remembering as well, these links can be between humans or between humans and the systems. So EastBL can be quite good for um, kind of modeling that above the line, below the line transition and above, above the line stuff as well. Um, I'm betting a bunch of people in this room have probably read Scott Snook's Friendly Fire about the, um, I saw some heads nodding, yeah. Um, this is a very complex incident and a very, a really great write-up about um, in the aftermath of the first Gulf War, we had um, some, some friendly, some US helicopters were shot, shot down by US planes. And Snook does a fantastic systems analysis of how this happens, or sort of an organizational kind of level analysis of how all this happens. But you can very clearly see that a lot of the problems were down to, over time, the organization drifted and sort of control links that were meant to be there suddenly developed gaps. So you can, you can definitely use this for, for above the line stuff. It's great for sort of team coordination. You know, did you have an, or, an, an incident that sort of fell between multiple teams? You know, did, did people, were people able to collectively make sense and work with each other's information? You know, what happened there? Okay, running out of time, but Nancy Levison's cast. Um, I've linked here to the cast handbook. This is really, um, this is a complex method, but the core of it, I think, to me, is thinking about hazards in our systems, constraints that we use to try and prevent ourselves from running into those hazards, and the controls that we use to prevent violating those constraints. So here's an example, um, SSL certificate expiration in production. We don't want that very bad. Um, <laughs> So can we remove or can we mitigate that hazard? I don't think so. We kind of have to have SSL. Um, so we, we impose this constraint, which is that we're going to renew our SSL certificates before they expire, ideally not two hours afterwards. Um, so we have either a manual or an automated process. We impose controls so we can monitor certificate re renewal automation if we have that. We can monitor certain expiry dates so we can kind of have these overlapping controls. We could have a CI check to make sure that all of our reference certs are configured to auto-renew and there aren't kind of, you know, certs that are not managed in that way. But here's, here's the sort of what, what you get from Stamp and Cast, higher level controls. So you don't just have a control and trust that it works. How many incident reviews have we all seen where we're like, ah, well, we had an alert and it broke and we didn't know. Like, there was one of these yesterday. Um, so you think about your higher level controls. Um, how do we regularly test that our monitoring still works? How, do we do a fallback kind of weekly review of our upcoming cert expiries? Maybe I don't like a weekly production meeting. So it gives us um, a way of thinking about that. And I think in an incident it, or an incident analysis, there's a lot of great questions that we can come up with. So what was the hazard here? You often don't have really a, a good idea of that from the initial sort of kind of dump of, of, of transcript and, and interviews. So if you can get a clear idea in your head of what the hazard, what the constraint, hazards were, what the constraints were, what the controls were, um, were there controls missing, were there controls failed? If there were missing controls, then why did that happen? There's a bunch of great questions to ask. Aximap. So this is the last one. Uh, this is a method by Rasmussen of the Rasmussen Triangle. So what you do here is you look at your system on a bunch of different levels, starting kind of um, at the bottom. We have the below the line stuff. We have software infrastructure. Then you have staff. So you've got kind of things that are happening with frontline staff, um, processes, kind of managerial stuff is up above. So cost cutting, building more features. So an interesting thing here is 
when you build an axiom map, you, you put in all of these things that you think are related to the incident, and then you try and you model the, the links between them. So what what kind of causes what what has a bearing on what? Um, and interestingly, you can see a bunch of cycles here. So there's a, bunch, there's a cycle that I've drawn here between having intensification of work, causing staff leaving, causing outages, um, causing more intensification of work, dealing with that. And there's other cycles in here as well. So then you could, if you wanted, you could go and model that sort of stuff using um, causal loop if you liked to. So there's too many tools here to apply all of these to each incident. You should use the ones that you think make sense. So like I said, for example, um, if you have something that is related to a automation gone wild, um, then I recommend that uh, the energy barrier perspective is nice for that. If you've got something that's definitely due to some sort of saturation um, issue, then you can look at utilization saturation errors, or you can look at causal loops for feedback related issues. Use what makes sense. You can use this for analyzing multiple incidents. You know. Um, what all of these uh, systems thinking methods do is they give us a sort of a, a different view of the structure of an incident. And if we do this well, then what we can see is we can see non-obvious commonalities between different incidents. So maybe one specific hazard is cropping up a lot. Or maybe across the board in an organization we are bad at implementing controls, um, that sort of thing. Maybe the way that we've structured our teams is causing a lot of broken links between particular teams in particular areas. So we have a lot of things that we can do here. So I'm gonna leave you with this. This is from a, a, a Doctor, Who, Doctor Who exhibit that I saw in Edinburgh a couple of weeks back. Answers are quest easy, it's asking the right questions that is hard. So ultimately, you can do a lot of things with all of these systems thinking methods, but what all of them can help you do is they can help you ask better questions. So I don't think we have any time for Q&A, but I will be around for the rest of the conference. I'm on Twitter, if that still exists, and I'm on the LFI Slack community. And thank you very much.